It's a serious question and a very simple one. Why is Africa poor? Now, we could pose a rhetorical uh, approach to this and uh, measure the intangibles of culture and language and tradition. We're going to do raw numbers today. Um, if you'll notice on the second part of my title, why we should care, the first part is a question, and I'll address some of those issues in a little uh, history uh, portion of Africa, and the second part is a call to action for us all. I spent some time in, in Uganda, I've spent some time in uh, some other areas of Africa, but mainly in Kampala, Uganda, where I taught uh, a couple of courses at a university. I asked my African college students this very question, why is Africa poor? Would you like to know what they said? I put it into a word cloud, and uh, the larger the word, the more frequency of the response. So African college students generally see the three main contributors to African poverty as corruption, lack of technology, and the legacy of colonialism. There is, a, if you'll notice, there's a lot of other uh, smaller words in here, such as dependency, war, China, aid, British, dictatorship, which plays into corruption, obviously, illiteracy, which plays into lack of technology. It goes all the way down to uh, poverty itself. So it's kind of a, a circular uh, response. I also asked my college students here why Africa is poor. Now these are genuinely quite sheltered uh, individuals who uh, don't know a lot about Africa. Would you like to hear what they said? Their main reasons to explain African poverty based were education, corruption, and government. Now the smaller words less frequently responded to, colonialism, diseases, which is something we see in, here in the news quite frequently. It's a, a land of diseases. That, is, uh, uh, that sells tickets to news agencies, but that's not necessarily the reality uh, on the ground in Africa. So we have some great misperceptions. There are a couple of areas here that, uh, uh, that coincide, and we will talk about education here shortly. Before we do, let's just get, we'll put those next to each other first off, so we can see one of each, the African response and the U.S. response. A brief history lesson, and I don't even presume to explain African poverty in 15 minutes uh, at a TED talk. But I will go through some of the more uh, important geopolitical aspects of African poverty, okay? That way we can have a little bit of context for the second part of this presentation. So, just a geography lesson. For those of us who are not that familiar with Africa, you can fit the contiguous 48 U.S. states, virtually all of Europe, India, China, and have lots of room left over for some South American countries into the continent of Africa. It is a very big place. This is a map indicating tribal and ethnic identity. We could start a little farther back in time and discuss the foreign uh, influences of Islam coming in and influencing the North, but for purposes of convenience and brevity, we will start really with the, uh, the beginnings of the slave trade. This is what the Portuguese and later the Dutch and the English and the French and the Belgians, etc., all participating in this, and yes, the Americans. This is what they encountered when they came down the coast of West Africa in the mid to late 1400s. And that is a bewildering administrative map. Could you imagine trying to manage this in any sort of political, with any sort of politi political logic? So you can see how this, which is the, the real 
ethnic and linguistic identity of Africa will make no sense to the foreigners, so they will superimpose their systems on the existing systems. This is a map of the colonies that came on the heels of the slave trade. France in the west, Britain in the east, uh, Italy with a few pockets here and there, the Germans, and the Belgians right in the heart of the Congo. King Leopold II, King of Belgium, one of his famous lines in this scramble for Africa in the late 1800s uh, allegedly said, I do not want to miss an opportunity to get a great slice of this African cake. So you can see how foreign influences will play in heavily to development as Africa progresses. We layer yet another system over Africa, and that is the independence era. The colonial era fades away following World War II. And now we have nation states all uh, organized according to boundaries largely set up by the Europeans. So if you'll remember back to our word uh, map, Colonialism was very high on the list for Africans. It was very low on the list for Americans to explain poverty. The legacy of colonialism is still very much alive, but it is not one of the major factors according to my research. So that is a bit of the context of the history of Africa explaining many, many foreign and competing interests. Now you layer into this at independence the Cold War. Russia, the United States, both competing for alliances in Africa. A growing global awareness of the almost immeasurable mineral wealth in Africa that has really been uh, uh, used to develop places outside of Africa. And you can see how this will become a pretty complex scenario and a lot of competing interests. All right, well, there's a satellite map of the great continent of Africa. And let's just uh, take a look at one spot in Africa. Let's take a look at the Democratic Republic of Congo. Right in the heart of Africa, right here. Around 88 million people live there now. Forbes magazine estimated a couple of years ago the mineral wealth of the DRC at $24 trillion, just the minerals, $24 trillion under the soil. Uh, sadly, most of the people of the DRC are not receiving the benefits of those mineral uh, uh, products. Well, why we should care? And now we'll get into some, some uh, hard data, I suppose. There is great power in numbers. Africa will double from 1.1 billion to 2.2 billion in the next 30 or so years. By the end of the, 20, uh, the 21st century, an estimated 3.5 to, 3 to 4 billion people will live in Africa. We've had Millennium Development Goals. Some of you are familiar with those. Most Americans are, are quite ignorant of them. Those have expired. It's been a 15-year process of development, and they've had uh, quite good success, remarkably. It's time to review and, and, and reevaluate re those, and we're in the process of that. China has invested heavily in Africa. China has commercialized Africa, whereas we, as the United States, have largely militarized Africa. We have little pockets of uh, uh, platoons here and there, one chasing Joseph Kony, another one being left behind after the Ebola crisis. Um, I don't know if those two are compatible uh, systems, Chinese commercialism and US militarism. We have now uh, an entire area, uh, AFRICOM, a command center set up strictly to surveil uh, uh, key parts of Africa. Now why is this in our interest? This is an ocean away. If it continues to be an area, an area of poverty, you can see how radicalism will be one of the only alternatives of the next generation. 
And we'll talk about the next generation. Um, of the 880 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, almost 50% are under the age of 15. So we have a, a real population issue on the horizon there, which is actually in our interest to address and uh, encounter. Let's do a little context here. What I have is I have a map of sub-Saharan Africa on the left and a map of the eastern US on the right. The circle, as we'll see in a minute, is New York City. All of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP is 1.5 trillion, the entire subcontinent. New York, the greater New York area, has 1.6 trillion. So if we put this in context, this circle on the right is that circle in the middle of the Congo, just to put it into uh, equal real estate there. Not a fair comparison, the richest part of the world to the poorest part of the world. But it does illustrate the, 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 the wealth gap that is widening. And if the rich keep getting richer, we can't fault them for that. And the poor, who are not necessarily getting poorer, they are merely getting less poor quickly enough because they are now integrating into the global economy. If these people, and, the, and the, the populations continue to grow as they are, feel like they're not being uh, dealt with fairly, you can see how radicalism can take root. And that's what I really want to address today. Now let's, uh, let's pull back the lens just a hair here and talk about education. That was one of the common denominators between my students here and my students in uh, uh, Uganda. This is a typical rural classroom. This is the day after class had uh, expired or, or concluded for the, for the year, uh, right? Uh, uh, this was the first day of uh, basically summer vacation. Certainly not uh, an adequate infrastructure. This is what was on the chalkboard on their last day of class. Well, these are the kids that should have been at school, but were gathering firewood. This is what was on the chalkboard on the last day of class. On the left, avoid early marriage, delay sex, Abstain from sex, AIDS kills. These are adolescents. Have a nice summer, kids. Not the message that we often give our children. So we've tried supranational institutions and their theories of economic development. The United Nations, World Bank, IMF. They have not had the greatest success. They've fomented corruption, they've lined the pockets of the leaders, and the general population usually has to fend for itself. So I am a firm believer uh, in the power of the private sector. Let me introduce a, a wonderful uh, woman named, named Grace Aya. Grace Aya received a microloan. It's been a few years now. She, was, she used to sell peanut butter uh, door to door. She would grind the, the ground nuts, the G nuts, she would put them into little baggies and she would sell them to little businesses for uh, a pittance. She got a $250 loan through a small microfinance company in northern Uganda. She had six children at this time and her husband uh, had been, had disappeared in a civil war up there. So she was a single mother with six children and a small business. With that loan, she was able to purchase a grinding mill, which is a, an electric version, ground a whole lot more uh, uh, peanuts, and she was also able to uh, get a refrigerator to preserve her inventory. Um, I followed up with Grace a couple of years later, and there she is, watching herself on the computer because uh, Frontline did a documentary film about her. The cameramen came, they filmed her, and then they left, and she never saw what happened of that. So I, she's actually watching herself on TV there and uh, having a good time. I followed up on her. All of her six children have educations, and she takes care now of 15 people from a $250 loan. This is, this is the Africa that can solve its problems. A little teeny seed money from we wealthy can go an incredibly long way with the African people. They are incredibly hardworking. Let me tell you another story here. First off, we think we invented capitalism. We didn't. 
Uh, if you've ever been uh, to Africa or anywhere uh, abroad, uh, negotiation, haggling, uh, they are masters at uh, maximizing profits. And yes, skin color does play into how much we pay for those goods. <laughs> Automatically triple the price just by showing up. Let me introduce you to another uh, success story, one of tens of millions taking place in among the, the rural areas of Uganda. Uh, this is Dennis Ayello. This is our, my first encounter with him. I had gone uh, a few years ago to uh, shoot a documentary film on the effects of globalization on indigenous cultures, how uh, the real challenges uh, that they face in trying to maintain their identity. And he was at the refugee camp. He was at this IDP camp. This is just on the heels of the Joseph Kony uh, uh, Civil War. I don't know if you're familiar with that. The Lord's Resistance Army had been trying to take over the government for 25 years, and they would abduct children and uh, force them into horrific things. Dennis was one of those children. Dennis Ayala was abducted at the age of nine or ten. He's not quite sure. He witnessed the, uh, the murder of his own father, was asked to help kill his own father, and uh, refused to do that. He got shot in the process but he was incorporated into the child soldier system of Joseph Kony. And he thinks he served for about three to four years. He's not quite sure how long he was there. Uh, time doesn't really make sense when you're that young and you live on the equator where it's, you know, the sun comes up at 6.30 and the sun goes down at 6.30 every day, all day, all year. So he's not quite sure of the timeline. But Dennis managed to escape in his uh, early teens and he made it to this refugee camp, this IDP camp, internally displaced persons camp. That's where we met him. And we were, we were happy to interview him. And, and uh, when he told us his story, it, uh, our, our hair blew back. It was so uh, gripping. I brought this information back home when the, the trip was concluded and shared it with my wife. And she immediately just said, we got to get this kid in school. So we communicated with, with Dennis. He was rehabilitated through the United Nations. He went through a, a normalization process and was living alone as an orphan in the, in the camp, surviving. He's a survivor, no doubt. Um, but he was really just left to his own devices after he had uh, qualified to be normal. He passed all the tests with the UN uh, psychological reviews. So he didn't really have much of many prospects. Uh, we helped him out, and this is not, not about our help to him, it's about his tenacity. Um, here's a, a shot of me interviewing him for that, uh, for that piece, and it, it's pretty gripping. This is where Dennis ended up. Dennis ended up, after school and dropping out of school, adopting a new family. He started taking in a few orphans and uh, uh, showing them love and compassion for the family that he never had. He now takes care of 45 orphans, and I don't know how many widows from the war. Um, this is the success stories you don't hear about in Africa. You hear of Ebola. You hear of Boko Haram. Uh, those are realities, but they are the exception. They are not the rule. Africa is a big place. I think we need to engage more with Africa because it is in our own selfish interests to do so in the long term. If you notice the population growth, 1.1 billion now, 2 billion in 25, 30, 35 years, as they become increasingly aware that they are being left behind, they will protest. Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, those uh, will uh, resonate among the youth with nothing to do. And there are abundant opportunities. So that's what I have a passion for. And I thank you for uh, spending time with me tonight.